Welcome along to this very special episode of Percussion Discussion. Um, strangely enough, you're not going to see me feature in this. Um, it's, it's a little project I've been putting together for probably the last four or five months. Um, ever since I was probably about nine or ten years old, I've had an absolute fascination and a love of Premier Drums. Uh, it still continues to this day. Uh, so for over 100 years, 101 just over, in fact, over 101 years, they've been producing some incredible drums and uh, I'm pleased to say they still are doing. Uh, so I decided um, to get a great, great group of people together to speak to them, uh, to get their thoughts and their opinions on Premier, some memories. So this is kind of a bit of a hodgepodge thing. Um, we've got some great professional drummers. We've got some industry guys. Um I hope you enjoy it. Uh, it's been a lot of work to put together, um, but I think there's some great stuff in there. I'm very grateful to everybody who's given up their time so generously to record these clips. Um, so thank you if you took part in it. Uh, I really hope you enjoy it. Um, this is also available uh, in podcast form. So if you want to listen to it, um, then please download it. If you can rate and review a percussion discussion podcast as well really helps and if you're watching on youtube if you wouldn't mind subscribing to that uh then that would be amazing as well um please comment on it uh, let me know your thoughts because i am fascinated it's something that i wouldn't normally do uh but it's been in the back of my mind for some time so i do hope you enjoy it thanks see you soon like, like millions of us um it was the jam and um and moon and clam burke obviously um and it was it was that you know it was just you know you, you played premier and it was that you know Nirvana it was kind of that was where you got and I had the book you know the um, catalog not got not got not got not got not got not got I think I had a drum key initially um, so yeah when it all finally you know things went better for me as I got older I got a phone call from someone and I can't remember who because I'm awful. Um, and um, and they said, you know, we'd be interested in. Would you like to play for Premier? Yes, I said. And and uh, and I got to do that. It's it's sickening. I got to go to the old factory. So when they invited me down to pick up the drum kit, it was it was in the evening because they you know, couldn't make it any other time. And so we went went down and they, they flipped the lights on, you know, in the big big old place and. I was aware of the different departments and stuff, but it was just really evocative. It was like um, going into a church, you know, this cathedral of everything that you'd, as a child, you kind of, it's like, oh my God, you know, I'm, and I'm not that way, you know? So it was a, a kind of, you know, the, the hallowed halls and um, with a big trucky uh, shopping trolley doodah and, and sort of, you know, all the big lights came on and there was this, it was like Raiders of the Last Ark and, and, uh, I was allowed to kind of just point and I was, you know, so young. And I was like, can I have one of those? I said, yes, you can have one. I can have four of those. Yeah, you can have four of those. Um, so that was, you know, for me, that was one of those sort of, you know, because I'm a simple, uh, that was a, a really big deal for me. I played Premier for 25 years, from 78 to 03. And why? Because I discovered this 252 pedal which I see one right up there uh, over your head. It is, yes. I discovered that. And then because, you know, the way the footplate lifts, you need to have a hi-hat that oh, hang on. was the same. Yeah. And so I had to get the premier hi-hat that oh, went with it. Oh, you got one of the new ones with the slots in them. But but anyway, um, I so I started using the premier hardware. And um, I, I don't remember exactly what led me to seek an endorsement. Um, but I, you know, love Phil Collins, love Keith Moon. I, I loved a lot of premier drummers and I love British rock bands, you know, in general, you know, um, you know, from, from the early rockers, of course, the, 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 to, to, you know, cream and to, to just, just, I just like the English vibe of how the English interpreted American music. Cause that's, but they did, right? The Jeff Beck group or yeah. Rod Stewart. Now, these are all the bands I used to go see in high school, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I approached them at the time. Um, Jim Coffin, um, rest in peace, 
um, who was later with Yamaha drums for many years. He was the guy who signed me the premiere in 78. And I stayed with them many years. And I did a really great tour of the UK and Scotland um, with Premier. Well, we just, every night we were at a different drum shop. You know, we must have did, you know, I don't know, 15 Amazing. different drum shops in, in, in a couple of weeks. You know, uh, it was just one a day. Uh, so so um, I got to visit the factory, you know. Right. And so, I, you know, I had in Leicester, right? Um and, and I had these these magazines and, and, and all their catalogs. And it was a real thrill for me to visit the factory. Played Elite first. Elite started with Elite. And then the Black Shadow came out. But Ooh. I really fell in love with the sound wave sound. And I asked them if they would make me a sound wave kit with a Black Shadow finish. I still have that kit. It's be- it's the kit I used on the video, yes, double bass sure. drumming. Okay, that that's a sound wave kit with a black shadow finish. Then when I started touring, I really didn't want to take that drum set out because they were just so beautiful. I asked them to make me one of those black, you know, regular what do you call that coating okay. vinyl or wrap, right? Yeah. And so they made me that. And when it came in, it just looked sterile, you know. So I hired this guy who did like race cars and he pinstriped it. Wow. And uh, that was the kit that I used on many records in the late 80s. So um, both Vinnie Moore records that I did, both uh, everything of that era, Fiona's records. Um, they were all with that Soundwave pinstripe kit. And then from there, I went to... Um, um talking premiere i went to uh signia the maple shells i didn't like them as much as the sound wave and it didn't have so much to do with maple versus birch it had more to do with sound wave used to reduce the shell diameter slightly and the head overhung and it the toms had that timpani vibe you know um i love that they were they sounded big they were easy to tune, um, and I harped on them for that. Like, oh God, you got to bring that back. So that's what Janista was. Janista was, let's do Birch like Soundwave, and that was the last kid I had. I think uh, with Premiere before I signed the I DW worked, um, at Foots for about four or five years, and um, and whilst I worked at Foots, I started going to drum clinics in london and i started to go to drum clinics in europe um i used to go to the Koblenz drummers meeting and i went about two or three years running and whilst i was there i met some of the guys at premier and um uh and then one year lee worsley who did the job at premier before i did of artist relations and marketing he called, he said, are you going to go to the Koblenz drummers meeting and i said yes i would he said could you would you whilst you're there look after rod morgenstein and i said yeah of course no problems i was going to be there um i used to uh, go out to help um with zildjian stuff um and uh, i looked after rod and whilst i was there a couple of other maybe a couple of other premier indoor season when i began to make a name for myself you know it gets to a point where companies begin to get a little interested in uh signing you up as an endorsee and my first endorsement was with Rogers Drums. And uh, this is going back to, uh, I'm guessing, the late 70s. And part of the Rogers deal involved uh, getting peisty cymbals. And so I was living in Atlanta, Georgia, but I was coming home to visit family in New York. And, uh, so I was told I could go pick up um, my Pisces symbols at a distributor on Long Island. And when I went there, I met the person who was working in the percussion department of the, dis- you know, it was a full full line distributorship. And they distributed Pisces symbols and North drums. Remember those funny drums? They looked like portholes. Okay. So, um, uh, you know, so I met, the person whose name was Tom Myers. He was working in this department 
And uh, so I got the Pisces symbols and then we struck up an acquaintanceship that through the years became a friendship and a really, really deep friendship. And um, several years later, Roger, uh, I was informed by by the person working uh, as the head of Roger's Drums, who was, I can't remember his name. Um, he quietly told me, Rod, just between you and me, Rogers is not going to be around, you know, within the year. And, uh, you know, you should probably start putting feelers out for other companies that you might be interested in. And um, so around that time, Tom Myers had started working for Premier and he was running their U.S. operation. And, um, I, you know, so it just made perfect sense to me. Wow, I have a friend who's running this drum company. Uh, I've never played Premier Drums. I certainly was aware of them, but they didn't have a very large presence in the United States at the time. And they were really in that moment, like 1983, 84, looking to make a big push and put put the Premier name on the map over here in the States. And, uh, you know, Tom said, Rod, uh, you know, uh, you'd probably be like the face of the company in the United States for starters, because we'll do a big ad campaign. Um, and, and we'd love to get you out there doing clinics because you're a schooled musician. Um, uh, you know, you talk intelligently and you know what you're doing since you learned it since age 11, taking private lessons and then ultimately going to college. Uh, Tom Myers from... Uh old premier percussion USA. I was uh, working for a company called Music Technology. And uh, when, when premier severed relationships or actually Selmer severed relationships with uh, premier when they purchased Ludwig, premier was looking for a distributor. So MTI uh, became that distributor. And that was running for about six to eight months. And then uh, MTI had to have, started to have financial difficulties. So Premier had a, uh, a dormant company in the U.S. registered in Delaware. And they said, well, maybe we should do this ourselves. So at that time, I happened to be the lone employee in the U.S. So they said, well, do you want to give this a go? And I said, well, sure. Uh, prior to that, I had worked with Peisty with, uh, when they were being distributed by MTI and North and Fibes Drums I worked for back in the day. So, uh, yeah, we started. We started Premier Percussion USA with myself, my brother-in-law, and uh, one secretary. And I uh, was really happy because, you know, the they were great people. I went to the factory and met them, and it was just, you know, a beautiful time, and I really fell for the product. You know, it was it was great stuff. It really was. Well, the the first Della Porter brother I met was Clifford. And he was like the mad in, inventor, you know? He looked like uh, uh, Doc from Back to the Future running around the uh, the factory in a, in a lab coat and stuff. And and he kept, you know, the, he had me in the boardroom and he kept bringing in these things. And he's like, well, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? And I'm looking at this stuff and... Uh, one of the things you brought in was a, a stress ring, which was, uh, I'll say this your way. It was uh, an aluminum hoop that he just came up with, but uh, that's perfect for marching percussion. Weird things, you know, he just come in and out. And then he came in and he said, well, I have this hookup and it's a 252 pedal and it's mounted to a cowbell. 
And I said, that's great, Clifford, except that's the most expensive bass drum pedal on the market right now. So I don't know how many people are going to, you know, go for it. And uh, some of the artists at that time were using the hardware. And the old Trilock boom cymbal stand was between the, the cymbal rod and the counterweight. It extended, you know, like five foot or something ridiculous. And, you know, guys were kidding and saying, listen, you know, every time my lead singer turns around, he gets knocked out by the cymbal stand, you know. So I said, Clifford, why did you, why is that so long? You know, because at that time, Thomas were shorter and this. And he goes, oh, well, we designed that for guys that play on cruise ships. You know, when the boat lists, the weight, you know, is, is more centered. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's not a real big market, but, you know. Hi everybody, my name's Adam Parsons and I'm going to tell you my journey with Premier Drums. And it all started when I first started playing. Um, I got an old John Gray kit, it was my first kit when I was 15. Um, very wrecked, calf heads all split and everything. They had a Premier snare drum from the 50s that somebody had, would you believe, painted with white emulsion, so go figure. Anyway, um, I decided to get another kit that was all new and shiny and um, the Premier kits at the time were a bit... Uh, beyond my price range, so I got a, a cheap Taiwanese brand. Um, but within a year, year and a half, I wanted a pro kit. I was gonna go with an American brand, most famous name on drums, if you know who that is, and it was a, a chrome over wood kit. But then, what happened is I was reading Modern Drummer, an avid reader of Modern Drummer, and in the October uh, 82 issue, that I was flicking through it, and this advert appeared. This, um, would you believe, opposite page the Neil Kirk drum giveaway at the time. Um, but this was an amazing looking kit. And in the back of it, it was there was a write-up on the 82 NAM show in Atlanta. And there was actually a photo of the kit that was debuted at the 82 Atlanta show. You see that one there? Oh my God, fell in love with it. Had to have one. So I went to my good friend, Paul Warsaw, who now works for Korg in the UK. Been a great friend of mine for 40 plus years. He was working at my local music store, Carlsbury in Nottingham, and I ordered a Black Shadow kit. That was in the, uh, the winter of 82. It, I think it arrived in the June of 83. It took ages to come. Anyway, played that kit for all the way through to about 88 when I got another one. I was out on the road with bands and uh, I got another kit, but I kept that kit. Went through a phase in 1991 where I was selling a lot of gear and I sold that Premier kit. One of my biggest regrets in my life. I don't know why I did it, but I did. Anyway, so um, a few years ago, a great friend of mine, um, a drummer called Scott Chirillo, had a Black Shadow 9, and we're talking, and he wants to sell it. He's living in Texas at the time. So anyway, this kit behind me is Scott Chirillo's Shadow 9, which I now own, and I'm not getting rid of. So don't even ask me if I'm selling it. And it's absolutely fantastic. 222s, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 18 floors, full set of Trilock hardware, 252 pedals, uh, Trilock hi hat stand, the full works. And it's absolutely phenomenal. And I love it to death. And just takes me back to the days when I was looking through all my catalogs, like the Black Shadow ones here, that I picked up and I still, I've still got. This was my favorite, this one here. Some of you may have, may have seen this or own this still. Great catalog. Anyway, so that's my story of my Black Shadow. Um, his father had a, a drum shop, Paramount, in, uh, in Shaftesbury Avenue. And his father, if this was the days when drums were downstairs, you know, in the basement, if you were lucky or, or even worse than down in the basement, you know, it was... Um, Nobody cared about drums in those days. So um, Ivor or Ivor's father wanted to get um, 
Premier drumsticks. And Premier told Ivor's father that, they, that he wasn't big enough to sell their drumsticks. And Ivor held that against him all his life. And so when I was writing the book with Ivor, I mean, I had that in the back of my mind all the time. And uh, I mean, it is what makes the biz our business what it is. It is what it is. But um, my, my first, um, I never was an endorser. And I don't think I was ever asked, even through the Adam Faith days. Um, but of course, I played Premier and um, and I have looked at more Premier drum kits than most people did. You know, I was on, I used to go up to Leicester a great deal to see the new drum kit or see the new colour or see the new uh, the new material or whatever. So I began going up there and saw I was reviewing. There was an electronic drum kit. I don't know if anybody's mentioned. I don't know if White has mentioned the the electronic drum kit. Well, there was one, and it was um. It had been made. It, it was made to happen by a guy in Germany, who had, and um, and he made it for Premier. And Premier brought it out. And the first time I saw it was on EastEnders. And the guy I can't remember which guy on EastEnders was playing it, but there it was, the new Premier electronic uh, drum kit. So it was product placement without you know that you'd never seen before. You know there there's this drum kit on the biggest thing as far as TV was concerned, uh, since sliced bread. So I was there to review the drum kit, and I, I did that. And while I was looking around the factory, or looking around the showroom, I saw this drum kit, which was cream and gold. And it was small sizes. I'd like to say it was an 18-inch base, but it was probably a 20. But it looked absolutely wonderful because it was cream, and it had gold fittings. Now, whether they were gold plated or or brass or whatever it was was irrelevant. It just looked great, and it's the only Premier drum kit I've coveted. And I I must I must talk to Whitey one day, so if he remembers it, you know, because it was for somebody. And it's the sort of thing that, that that Whitey would have wanted, and who wouldn't? So anyway, it it didn't it didn't happen, or if it did happen, I never saw it. So if anybody's got it, let me know. I'd be very interested to get a photograph of it. I'd just finished an apprenticeship in 1970. Um, and my thing I really wanted to be in life was a pro drummer. However, um, I, I remember thinking, I wonder if Premier Drum wants anybody. Is there any vacancies? So I went along to Canal Street, which is the first place Premier had outside of the London thing, going back to before the war. Literally knocked on the door, went in and said, have you got any jobs? And the gentleman said, sit down. When can you start? Two weeks on. I found myself in the tune percussion department at uh, Pullman Road, which was fantastic. And, of course, I spent the next 12, 13 years in a sweet shop. And I can remember the smells and the sound. And for somebody like me, uh, going down there through a door, turn right, and the symbol departments on me right. I've always had a thing about symbols, a lot of us have, and I was intrigued straight away. And at my job anyway was assembling timpani. So we'd get the bases, we'd fit the struts on, etc. We had the fiberglass bowls, copper bowls, and of course the pedals that you depress, putting the heads on, wrapping them, and off they went to the warehouse. After about six months, I don't know I'd love to know who the person was, but somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said, would you like to move to the warehouse? So I said, yes, because it would be, I'd be in touch with everything, all the product. So I went down to Blaby Road, which is not very often spoke about. Oh, sorry, Magna Road, which is opposite where the Blaby factory was. And I went through a door there to clock in, two doors. And the first thing that I was met with was a rack of, uh, white marine pearl drums as wide as you like and as high as the ceiling and I thought this is heaven and I spent heaven there the next few years basically and I was responsible then for goods inwards which meant I had vans coming from Canal Street with drumsticks on um, certain things like that and then from Pullman Road the finished items the hardware 
uh, the timpani that I was once involved with, and of course the drums. A typical day's intake of drums there, if they were doing 2000s and drums with interior mechanisms, uh, military drums as well, especially with top snare drums, we'd only probably have 50 to 80 drums in per day. But, but very often the intake was like 150, 200 drums. And they all had to be catalogued and put away in, in racks, you know. The same with the hardware. They came in the 315 Premier Hi-Hat stand. One of the things of working at Premier, by the way, you get a head full of numbers. 50 years later, I still know that a 433 is a 13B9 TomTom. -tom. Useless information now, but it's all there still. Um, so there you go. But anyway, we, um, they're in boxes, the hardware. Five IATs, you were picking five up and putting them in a rat and so on. I also did order picking there, um, shipping. I also went on a van, of all things to say, one day with an old boy called Steve, a character, and we went to um, oh, the famous drum shop in London. Premier used to, it's just closed. Um, Foots, Foots. Yeah, I went on a delivery to Foots. Anyway, moving on. Um, I met some fantastic personalities there at Premier. I'm talking about the staff. And there was nobody bigger and better in my view than Rex Webb. Uh, he was the national sales manager at the time. A, for, to me, a larger than life character with a huge personality, great sense of humour, which is, I think as a musician, all of us, it's, it's a done, done deal. And one day I said to him, oh, I play a bit of drums. And of course... He then started to call me. He'd come out into the warehouse and he'd bellow my name. And we set up a, uh, he's got somebody collecting, a, it was Blue Shimmer. X used to be the catalogue thing. And we just did a, a small time, floor time, a bass drum. And he, he got me to sit behind it and play it. And he said, you've got good technique. What are you doing here? And he tried to sell me a, a sort of gig on the pier at Wales or something. He said, looking for a pro drummer, Stu. Why don't you go there? But anyway, I never did. So uh, once he saw me play, if he needed something, he would come to me. Um, there are two outstanding memories for me, because I think a lot of people would say to me, did you meet Keith Moon? Did I meet this one? But sadly, no, I didn't meet. But I did, did meet two great people to me. Um, one day, um, Rex was trying out the S4181 pipe band drum. And he shouted, bellowed my name, and I met a guy called Alec Duthart, who was the World Championship Pipe Band drummer. Might not mean a lot, but opposite where we were, there was a social club behind that field. And I went over there with Rex and Alec, and this, you think you can play rudiments, you get with these Scottish guys, I'm telling you. And it scared me to death, and I'd listen to him, and then I had to put the same drum on, and try and do something, follow him if you like. And that was quite an experience. That was fantastic. And of course, one of his young people in his band at the time, the Shots and Die Kid, was a very famous young Jim Kilpatrick, who came to work for Premier. He reps and he now travels the world, actually, I believe, demonstrating uh, pipe band techniques. My other great uh, memory a personal favourite drummer of mine, because I've always been sort of big bandy, jazz, whatever. Um, the Kenny Clare kit, which was the former of the Resonator, I changed a bass drum head with Kenny Clare at the Magna Road Warehouse. And that was just just to change a drum head with a hero. It was like, I just, just fantastic for me. Uh, it's only a simple thing, but I just loved it. So Premier was um, basically Premier was basically uh, my uh, my brand of choice because being British, it was the most prevalent uh, brand that you could see in uh, music shops. And back in the seventies, when we had loads of music shops, because uh, uh, I'm originally from Manchester, so there were there were loads there. Uh, um, not, and they had great representation. And the other thing they were incredibly good at was making sure that, that they had lots of um, bro brochures and leaflets and, of course, talking drums, newsletter. So publicity-wise, they were everywhere. 
but they weren't they weren't the most fashionable um a brand out there and a lot of people would uh, put them down for no reason really uh, other than they were snobs because uh, I know that um, uh, from personal experience I mean there was a certain American brand that was very popular uh, in the 70s and everyone uh, aspired to and I, di I did as well because I inherited that uh, how if you're going to be taken seriously this is the brand that you have to play um and i remember getting my first kit uh and being um slightly um how shall i say uh, di uh, disappointed on how difficult it was to get um heads to fit because heads are uh, drum heads are round and uh, it's very difficult to get them on egg shaped shells but um you never got that with uh, with premier and uh, the build quality was um, as i discovered later in life um so much better uh, and I think one of the problems with Premier was because they were so, especially in the 70s, which was their uh, golden years, um, really, they were very hot on representation. And that meant that when you turned on the TV, uh, if there was like the two Ronnies or uh, whatever, the Eurovision Song Contest or whatever show, musical show there was, the kit being played by the guest band or the or, uh, house band was a premier kit. Now that's all well and good, but I was um, I was a teenager and I wasn't really into that sort of stuff. That it wasn't cool because um, I didn't want to wear a sparkly suit and a bow tie. Um, I was uh, t-shirts and leather jackets and making lots of noise. So that was sort of like a downside for premier. Um, but I gradually found myself. Um, drifting towards, <clears throat> excuse me, towards Premier, uh, simply because of the availability and the quality of the build against the cost. And um, certainly when you look at the uh, things like uh, the Lockfast and the Trilock stands from the 70s, even now, some of them are like new. You know, these are 50-year-old pieces of hardware that are still perfectly functional uh, and better than probably uh, a lot of stuff that's um, out and about now made of um, Chineseium, which, uh, you know, doesn't last that long. Um, so that was, uh, that was how I became um, sort of um, embroiled with them. Plus when I, um, when I got older, and I was uh, found myself in the situation as most old, you might not get as many uh, playing jobs as you'd like. Uh, what am I going to do to earn a living? And I became more and more involved in teching, uh, restorations and repairs and what have you. Uh, and this was probably about, oh, I don't know, 20 odd years ago when the whole... The, British vintage drum uh, community was in uh, was in its infancy uh, in Premier, and it soon became clear when I started um, repairing them and sourcing parts uh, that their high quality and uh, their um, the, the whole the plethora of things you think you know the drum kit is fairly complicated but because of all the different snare drums and stands and what have you that they've done over the years um it was uh, it was quite uh, quite a challenge to uh, to be able to supply all these spares and you know once you get uh, into it you just get sort of drawn in and you your nighttime reading is a, is a parts manual and uh, you, you know memorizing all the parts and you talk in part numbers, not descriptions, um, very slippery slope. But uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, how I uh, got into Premier. My earliest and fondest memories were being like a kid at Christmas when I used to visit the Premier factory in all its glory. I remember pulling up and seeing some iconic drum set in the tower and at the front of the property and and as the lights it got darker the lights the floodlights came on and you could see this drum kit from as you passed through the factory at Wigston 
and it was brilliant. I mean, at that time, there were craftspeople of all kinds there. There were people that knew everything about the harvesting of Finnish birch. There were people that knew everything about the chroming uh, of, of metal and steel and, and what the properties are of, of getting the best out of, of the materials that they had. It was fantastic. There was a tea lady that came up there and, and down the factory at 11 o'clock and a canteen. It was a proper old school factory. And, and for that period of time, when I was I first started to work as a, a premier as, as an endorsee and then as part of the design team with Nick Hudson and Andy Laidlaw, it was absolutely fantastic. I think even at those earliest points, you could see that change was on the horizon. Um, economic change. Um, it was always going to be difficult doing high level manufacturing in the UK, as we know, and we can see the results of that to this day. But at that point, it was fantastic. Ooh, I was about four or four or five years old, 69, something like that. Um, my granddad gave me um, his kit that he bought in the early 60s, which was a Premier Ajax hybrid. I still got it, by the way. And in late 69, he went and bought himself um, a 303 Grey Shimmer, which, again, I've still got all of the original heads, original cases, his original sticks, everything. And so he gave me his kit. So the Grey Shimmer is still in the family. And what I did do, I, I went up to meet Colin um, a few years ago. Um, I think it might have been 2016 or 2017. Yeah. And I took my grandfather's Grey Shimmer Tom up and – after, after the meeting, we drove past the old factory with the, the big round tower. And I've got a photograph of holding my grandfather's Tom Tom on the fence just in front of it, thinking this was probably made in there. And I was like, wow. Um, well, I was actually sitting right right where I am now when I had the phone call on the Thursday evening. Um, it was from a, a friend of mine whose brother works for ACDC, still does. And uh, he said, are you available tomorrow to go to London? Because ACDC is in town shooting two videos and Phil's not there. I'm like, I was literally like, so anyway, uh, I spoke to, to Dickie, the drum tech, and he said, well, what drums you got? I said, well, I've got Red Sparkle on black and this, that, and the other. He said, I'll bring the black one, which, you know, Phil Rudd uses black. So I took it up. And, of course, it had BR on the bass drum. It was the 26. And I remember Angus and Brian was just stood in front of me, and Angus said, uh, God, is that a 24? I said, no, it's a 26. And he said, oh, I bet that gives a good good thud, you know. But they didn't mind about the BR on it either, so I just left it there. But, yeah, Premier on, on an ACDC video, two ACDC videos, it's like 74 million views now and, and going up for the two of them, you know. Um, but, yeah, yeah, it's good for Premier. Working with Steve White um, to make the modern classic range of snare drum. Steve had a very clear idea of sort of a back to vintage kind of um concept for snare drums and um uh we made a lot of prototypes and eventually we settled on one that he really really liked and uh and then we were banging around what were we going to call um that range of drums and Steve was playing with Weller at the time and Weller had just introduced uh, he just put out a greatest hits record called modern classics and i just said why don't we call these name the modern why don't we call it the range modern classics because it's summed up um you know a vintage snare drum but made with kind of you know cutting edge technology or the technology of the day and steve said yeah it sounds like a good idea i just need to go and speak to weller about it and, and he went away and he came back and he said weller's up for it on one condition and i said what is it and he said um he wants that Union Jack Janista kit uh, that was on the front cover of um, the Premier brochure. Uh, he said he wants that kit. And we knew where the kit was and we talked about it and we said, yeah, OK. So and we said, OK, well, we want a photo of him with you. And we went to a studio. I can't remember where it was, where... Um, uh, Steve was recording a Weller record um, and Weller came in and posed behind Steve's kit and we took some great pictures and we gave uh, Weller this kit and we got to use um, the name. I used Plank. to go up very regularly. I was then asked to become part of the design team working on a new range of drums called the Modern Classics. 
And the team was Andy Laidlaw at that time and Nick Hudson, who's gone on to do some fantastic stuff, not only for Premier, but for Natal. He's a real, real clever guy. And we were given this this, this um, task, really, of, of streamlining the range a little bit because it was very difficult. And I know fans will go, yeah, well, I love the Signica. Signi- I love the Signia and I, I love the, the Janista and I love the design of the Signia lug and I love the design of the Janista lug. To produce two completely different sets of hardware um, in the same factory was virtually impossible and economically completely unviable. So everything had to be a little bit streamlined. So all we really did was take designs and take influence from the glory years of Premier, the undersized shells, and we, we, we kept the sort of shell sizes uh, in reference to uh, product that had been used in the past. Even the lug design was um, something that we'd seen in a very old catalog from the 1930s. It was all originally influenced by Premier design and Premier uh, standards. So that, you know, for anybody that's a bit critical about that, the, the, the changes were made under the guise of what had gone before. And we came up with some absolutely fantastic drums. The, the name came from the Paul Weller album, Modern Classics. And that was a greatest hits compilation that Paul had out in 1997. And, and I played on pretty much everything on it. And we went to Paul and we said, look, could we use the name? And he was absolutely fine about it. But in return for actually using the, uh, using the name uh, that he, he inspired us to, 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 to use, um, he got the one of the Union Jack artist drum sets that Premier produced at the time. I think Paul Cook from the Pistols had one as well. And that went into Black Barn, Paul's recording studio. And I think it might even still be there to this day because I've been down there with Stone Foundation and recorded some tunes for them. And that was the, the house kit that was there. So it was great to get to play on it. And I think um, that pretty much anything that Paul's recorded there um, since I left is has used that old artist Union Jack kit. Paul did get a second kit. Um, there was a prototype, 2213, 16 by 14 floor tom, that was gifted to him as a, as a thank you because it wasn't going to be sold. Um, and about three months ago, I got a call from Paul's office saying, hey, Whitey, there's a, this, this old Premier kit that's, that's here and Paul wants to know you've got first refusal if you want it. And I was like, yeah, no, I'm, great, I'll have it. So it, it turned out it was one of the prototypes. Now, I believe that drums should be used. One of my friends was looking for a, 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 a drum kit to use in a ska band that he plays with, a guy called Harbin Shry. And I just said, look, mate, if you want to go and pick the kit up, then it, you can use it. And, and it saved him a few quid. So it is currently in use around um, South London. Um, you know, it, and, and that was um, that was a really nice kit. I really I, I remember that kit really fondly. That was when uh, a later point when uh, Keith Keogh started to work for Premier. Um, so there was the modern classics and then there was all the, the, the later stuff that we did, which uh, as really, I, I would say, has kind of um, blossomed the, those those roots were, that were were uh, planted at Premier is now the British Drum Company because, um, you know, Premier sort of went off into its direction. And Keith took that name on with with Al Murray and, and Ian and, and all the great guys that work at BDC. Oh, I wish they still made them. No. And to be honest, uh, I mean, I've. I've used all sorts of pedals, especially since the uh, you know the double bass drum pedal thing came in. Um, so, um, but before that, when I was using two bass drums, I, yeah, I had the Premier two fifty S pedals, and I just loved them. You know, I really did. And when when I actually got to use the double pedal, I still found it quite difficult to. Um, I was always aware that my foot was on something different to a Premier 250S. And um, I still got the, those pedals, but I, I, I don't use them anymore. But, um, but yeah, I used to love them. It was like a, a, a comfortable slipper. You know, you never aware of my feet, what my feet were doing, because the, the pedal was just felt uh, totally natural. Cozy Pal used to use 250S as premiers, and uh, apparently he bought the last lot, you know, when the, when I don't know what happened to Premier at the time, but he, he bought all of the 250S pedals. I think it was 1984 when I officially became a Premier endorser, and uh, 
you know, true to the company's words, um, you know, I'd open up Modern Drummer and there's full, full page, four color ads with me. And we did all, you know, sorts of, you know, fun type campaigns. And then uh, I was sent out, you know, doing uh, lots of drum clinics through the years. Um, and it was just a great, great experience. Uh, I remember the very first drum set that I got was a Black Shadow, which I believe was part of that shell within a shell design that Premier did. The res Was it called the Resonator, I believe? Yeah. And... Um, and then, uh, you know, they asked me, well, OK, we want to you know, design a, a drum set for you. What would you like, you know, in a perfect world? And I said, I want something that looks like hammered copper. Right. So almost antique, old, beat up. And there really was nothing like that in terms of real copper. But they found a, a fabric or a, uh, a covering that they put on the resonator drums. And that, you know, that was my first, you know, uh, real like special personal drum set, which I have to this day. And at the moment I have it parked uh, in the, the recording studio of uh, John Mayung, who's the bass player from the group Dream Theater uh, in, his, in his home, uh, you know, a couple of hundred miles from me because that's that's where we write and record uh the jelly jam records i have a a side project band for the last few years with john and uh the guitarist sometimes singer in the group king's x ty Tabor. and uh so for the last two or three recordings i've used that hammered copper drum set from 1984 so the very first premier drum kit that i owned i bought from steve barney um i he was advertising a kit uh, uh it was a premier club kit i think from memory uh i think it had 8 10 12 14 and a 20 inch bass drum uh i think it was originally blue but he, he sprayed it white and i was just into the idea of having lots of toms so that was how i met steve and how i got involved with premier so I had that for a while, and then I got a, a Fusion, uh, was it APK or XPK? I think it's XPK, like in this Black Sparkle. And I had that on a rack in the 90s. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was my introduction to Premiere. And then when I, I'd been, I, I'd had a couple of gigs and I'd used a Yamaha kit, but I uh, was always drawn back to the Premiere brand. And when I got the kit, uh, the gig with Katie Tunstall, Things were just starting to take off and our tour manager knew George and he called George and he said, oh, there's this, uh, you know, new artist that's uh, starting to break and the drummers are interested in Premier Drums. And and I, I I don't think George had heard of Katie at that point. No one had. So I think he was a little bit like, mm, not sure about this yet. Um, but on the phone, George said to uh, Mo, who's our tour manager, he said, look, I've got uh, I've got this kit in the corner if he wants that he can have that that's all right and it was um red sparkle which was my color of choice and it was 22 12 14 16 which is the sizes i would have chose so i was like yes please so they uh that, that was sent to me i used that for 10 years with katie i've used that with billy bragg i've used that with brian ferry um and all the gigs in between loads of you know 20 years i toured that kit and I had like during my time with that Red Sparkle kit, I heard that it had been made for Clem Burke and um, uh, when he was overdoing something at some point. And uh, uh, and I did a gig with Brian in uh, in L.A. I think it was at the Greek Theatre and I'd gone backstage and I knew Clem Burke was there and I wanted to catch him. And I saw him in the corner of my eye across the room. But I had friends there and they were, you know, that was more important to acknowledge them and say hi to them and thank before I could get get to meet Clem. And uh, and I missed him. He left before I got to say hello. But I wanted to say, I think I'm playing a drum kit that you, <laughs> you might have played. Um, so, yeah, I you know, I love Premier as a brand. I met Keith through Premier, Keith from who's now a British drum company. Um, yeah, absolutely fantastic. And they've had a hundred, I think it's a hundred year anniversary last year. So, you know. Hopefully they'll keep going for another hundred. Growing up in Chicago, premieres were sort of a, a rare bird. You'd occasionally see like a four piece kit, but being that they're British and I grew up in Chicago, which was the home of 
Ludwig and Slingerland and whatnot. So you didn't really see them. So, uh, but I did see them and hear them. Um, insofar as uh, Phil Collins and the whole Genesis canon looms large in my life. Uh, and the same thing with the Who, Keith Moon, and uh, we all know that you know Phil Collins used Premier from '75 to the beginning of '82. So those are the in the air tonight drums, not not Gretsch, which he's mostly famous for playing the beginning part of his career and since 1983. Uh, so I was doing a, a two-day uh, drum clinic and master class at uh, Bentley's Drums in Fresno, California. Dana Bentley, uh, who's got an amazing shop, and he's got sort of an invite-only uh, museum. So Dana took me into his museum, which has incredible drums, drum kits, snare drums, oddities, and he had uh, most of this cantaloupe behemoth behind me uh, that was uh, initially 13, 14, 15, 16 concert toms, 16, 18 floor toms, two 22 inch bass drums, snare drum, uh, lock fast hardware, three stands, hi hat, snare drum stand. And he, Dana was the second owner. And apparently the original owner ordered this the week Keith Moon died as a tribute. And they were in pretty immaculate condition. And when I saw these drums, I thought to myself, uh, wait, it, my heart started to beat fast. It's sort of like if you're a Mercedes guy and then you see some old Ford Mustang that you didn't care about, but all of a sudden you see it and you're falling in love with it. And I, I couldn't get these drums out of my head. So I, I, I said, Dana, what, what would you want for, for these drums? So anyway, after a, a week or two of them haunting me, I had to have them, a, a deal was made. Dana sent me the drums. About a week later, I'm having dinner with Gavin Harrison as he came through town with King Crimson. And I was showing him pictures of the premieres. And uh, of course, Gavin, growing up in England, he's going to be uh, certainly uh, familiar with the drums. And uh, Gavin said, oh, I have my mate Mike Ellis is the guy. Like, if you need anything premiere, like he can find you anything, you need any harbor parts. So he put me in contact with Mike. Well, Mike tracked, uh, tracked down the uh, the 12 the 10, the uh, eight, and then finally the six, which was really the unicorn of this kit. So I have a full Octoplus six through uh, 16 concert tom uh, drum set that is, uh, you know, it, it's like walking into a 1978 catalog. The thing with Todd was, it was, um, was um, he's friends with Gavin Harrison, who I've teched for, and um, he'd obviously mentioned in conversation to Gavin that he got this premier kit, uh, and it he was looking for uh, some add-on toms. So Gavin suggested that he got in touch with me to see if if I could help. Now, the thing about um, finding uh, add-on toms to, to uh, a 40, 50-year-old kit in the business for 5, 10, 15 years until something um, becomes available. I mean, they're out there, but, you know, they're not always for sale. Uh, at the right time. Uh, um, so he sent me a, um, an email. So uh, I just thought, well, I don't know. I'll, um, I'll, ask, I'll ask around. You never know. And the first person I got in touch with was um, Dramatic, Tristan at Dramatic. And I said, oh, I'm after some concert toms uh, in Polygold, um, 6, 8, and 12, if you've got them. And he comes back straight away and says, yeah, I've got a pair. I've got six and eight in poly gold. And I was like, I don't believe it. I cannot believe that he's, he's got them. So that's how the six and eight came along. Um, and then uh, and I can't remember where the 12 came from, but that was like probably about two weeks later. I think I saw it on eBay or, uh, or something. And... Uh, so I bought that. Um, I bought that for uh, Todd and said, "Oh, look what I've got!" And uh, so, yeah, and, and that was it. And it was literally less than a month or so from him asking that we got three matching toms, and that never happens ever. Um, you know, you, you're waiting for years, as lots of people who will be watching this will know how difficult it is and what a nightmare it is to uh, to add on a, a matching drum uh, to to an old kit but um, hey you know the gods were smiling down on us
And the, the, the funny thing about these drums, they don't sound particularly great to the naked ear. But man, put two omnidirectional microphones in front and or some overheads, and man, it's, it's Abacab. It's like you have the Phil Collins sound instantly. The, the, the secret really is using uh, clear ambassadors and not using the black dots, which is gonna give you a much different sound. But you put clear ambassadors on those drums, and you're, you're the god of thunder. I've used those drums on, on many records for Tom overdubs or augmenting uh, the, the Pearl Masterworks kit that I'm sitting behind here. So it's just a great tool to have, and it came at a great time where, you know, everything old is new again, so concert toms are kind of having a resurgence. And what better concert toms to have than the Phil Collins and then there were three era concert toms in polychromatic gold, which of course Keith Moon used uh, in 1974 for uh, the second part of the Quadrophenia tour. So that way I can have both my, my childhood love for Phil Collins and Keith Moon all in one shot. And you know, I, I have to say one thing about the Lockfast hardware. In photographs, it seemed like, ah, this sort of antiquated uh, hardware. That's all they had back in those days. But to see them up close, it's like Italian furniture design art. It really is spectacular. And the diamond chrome, I guess it was Rolls Royce that was, they used the same uh, uh, chrome facility uh, for their, uh, their hardware. It's just absolutely immaculate. I mean, I got to say that, that like Sonar and Premier had the two, but most stunning chrome plating. Uh, but it, it, they definitely seem like they don't belong in this room with all the wood drums of, you know, Babinga and Rosewood and whatnot. And they shine like the sun, and I, I love them dearly. I didn't know that I would love them uh, the way that I do. Um, I'm, I'm still a, a, a pearl drum uh, uh, artist here, and these are the main kit. But boy, when I want that flavor, nothing can do what those do. Well, hi, I'm uh, Colin from, from Premier. I've, I've been with the brand now for 25 years. I wouldn't say long years because they've actually flown by. Um, and I, it's been a, a fantastic journey so far. And I think that that kind of was like, a, it kind of like culminated last year, like with that, that 100th kind of anniversary kind of centenary launch that really kind of like, almost like kind of bookended it for me, like starting off kind of in the, the Wigston factory uh, back in 98 uh, um, as a junior, kind of a, I was a, a marketing kind of assistant. And I kind of really saw all aspects of the business. I, you know, I kind of saw it kind of in that, that kind of like the heady days of like all of the production in kind of one facility. And then the like the, the subsequent changes kind of over the, you know, over the next 25 years, really. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's me. Um, and I think the first proper snare drum I got was, you'll know the name of it. It was the, the beaded one that, that's like a copy of the 402. What was that thing? Is it 35? Yeah. And, and it was really interesting. I, even now I can, I remember how profound it was to have a snare drum that didn't go crack or whatever junk I was using. To have a snare drum that sounded like, oh my word, you know, that's, that's correct. That's, yeah, that, you know, those kind of moments where you're just so grateful to get hold of something that's a musical instrument, not something that's been thrown downstairs. So, yeah, Premier, that imprinted stuff, childhood kind of. It's one of the reasons I'm kind of, you know, that I have a strong loyalty to them because it's, it's you know, I'm hefted to it. Um, and equally, when, because um, I've been asked this before, when... Uh, uh, you know, I've been in dips in my career, and there have been many. Um, they've not kind of said, oh, "Okay, well, that's it now." You know, give us all these things back. They've they've always been really kind of, you know, the uh, what's the word, Ge uh, generous, you know, and and patient. So oh. yeah, I, I I kind of I, I feel I owe them that as well. Uh, there was a solid red one we did for a, a Gabriel tour. Um, and 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 then then they, they they really kindly made me a a black open drum drum set for recording you know just because we were uh, we were looking at getting that seventy sound of open drums and I rang them and they were fab you know and they said well, yeah we'll we'll put something together for you so 
So I've still got that, but I've only used it in its entirety in the studio. I've used bits of it live, but um, yeah, I think that's it. And then too many, and then an embarrassing amount of snare drums. <laughs> and then what's that lovely thing I've got at the minute? The, the We call it the orc, um, the orchestral drum, which is again, to be experienced, it's just beautiful. <laughs> It's kind of structural damage at Soundcheck. That's what we're aiming. The business at the time when I was working for them was run by a guy called John James. And uh, John was uh, a cabinet maker. He ended up working for Wharfdale, which became the Mission Group. And Mission Group owned Premier in the 90s, um, which was they kind of bought it off of, off of Yamaha. I think there was one somebody in between but they inherited and they were the company that were responsible for making the signia and the ginister kits and john uh was yeah, he was like a british aristocrat really and i remember him coming in one morning and throwing on my desk the mail on saturday magazine that had an interview with eddie jordan from jordan grand prix and uh, eddie had a premier kit in his house and he said to me let's see if we can get eddie on board and we made a phone call and we contacted Jordan Grand Prix and we spoke to Eddie's PA and said, look, we've seen this in the paper. We'd like to make a kit for Eddie. Would he be interested in it? And she said, why don't you write to us? And we wrote and the letter came back. We would love to do that. He would love to do that. So we made a kit for Eddie, a Janista kit in that yellow colour of the Jordan Grand Prix cars that uh, Damon Hill drove. And... Uh, we got some stickers, um, the buzzing Hornet stickers, um, and I hand applied them to these yellow drums, uh, 12, 13, 16, 22, and a snare drum, uh, two stickers on each. So the badge was in the middle and a sticker on either side, which had a, a buzzing Hornet, and they faced into the um, faced into the badge. And we made the kit and we took the kit to Eddie at the factory and we presented it to him at the Formula One factory. And he set it up um, on the floor and played the drums in the middle of the Formula One factory. And then he took us over the road to Silverstone for a testing day and uh, treated us as his guests. And uh, he obviously kept the drums. And then I get a phone call, um, maybe ahead of an event. And he'd phone, he'd phone up personally, he'd say, Andy, it's Eddie Jordan. I'd say, hi. He said, uh, I, I, can I use the drums for this thing? And I'd say, what is it? And it would be, you know, the ball after the Formula One British Grand Prix or the 10th anniversary of Jordan Grand Prix at Donington. And what he was saying is, would you come down and set them up for me? So I'd go to the Jordan factory on Friday night, pick the drums up, put them in my premier car, um, and drive to wherever he was doing this gig, set them up, sit behind him as his roadie whilst he played the drums and he'd be playing with Thin Lizzy or Damon Hill or Jules Holland or whoever it was, and then put the drums away and then take them back to the factory on Monday and put them in a little store. It was the thing, as we discussed earlier, perhaps, that the t TV was currency then for um, selling drums because it was pre-internet, obviously. We just had uh, beepers and... Obviously, and um, so yeah, it it was it, everything was get get on telly with your with the, the premier drum kit kind of thing, and everyone was really happy. And then you know it's, it's different now because I don't I'm not sure if TV exists, does it? It's not even yeah. Fun. So Elite and Janista kind of have kind of like existed in the range, certainly like Janista since the kind of mid to late kind of two thousands. Um, albeit it was a very different looking kind of like product to the original Janista that came out. And I think what we we kind of found was that corners were being cut and decisions being made in those products that essentially started to lose a little bit of the essence of what Janista stood for, maybe when it was kind of originally kind of put out there. So that to me was quite a, I'm not going to say uh, an easy fix, but it was a really exciting little project to sink our teeth into uh, kind of ahead of that kind of centenary launch. And it was to just go back and look at what Janista was. And we got all of the original kind of drawings out. We've still got all of those kind of like original factory production specs. And the kind of like conversation kind of went very quickly as to, well, 
can we not just kind of reintroduce the identity to it with the larger kind of lug casings on the bass drums? Could we take those shells back to the original kind of like six mil undersized kind of like diameters? And and very quickly it was like, yeah, we're, we're getting the spirit of the Janista back. And and I think why that was important was, you know, it, it, it's showing that we're trying to take a bit of a nod to our legacy. You know, we want to, whilst we don't have that factory today, we absolutely want to kind of honour the spirit of what Premier is, but keep continuing to move it forward. I think it's very important not just to kind of reissue something from the past, but take inspiration, kind of come up with new ideas based on that and introduce it for like today's players. Because I think that's what Premier has always been about. It's always kind of propelled forward with like fantastic design, kind of amazing kind of innovations and like strong kind of engineering kind of principles behind it. I think you can trace that back to like the beginnings of the company. So everything we try and do now is kind of like steeped in those values. Um, and Elite as well, which we kind of uh, kind of, shall we say, like re relaunched kind of last year. Again, we, we took a similar approach to that. It, it kind of existed as a as a product range, um, albeit it was very difficult for people to actually kind of purchase. It was an expensive product. Um, it was difficult to order. So we set about with how we could bring this like premium level product down a bit, make it more affordable for players, but also give it a bit more of a like a premier spirit. And, and that was to look at the thin shells. And um, so we went after, you know, the, the 4.8 mil thick kind of shells with support hoops. And it was just just giving it a little bit of a, a nod to the past. Um, but at the time of the development, we had a whole range of shells. We'd, we'd kind of designed different kind of sandwiches, different kind of um, constructions. And this one just sang just as soon as we put those heads on. We, we, we didn't have to do anything to that that kit. And we we feel we've got a such a like a premium level product kind of together that um you know it is affordable for players because it, it's difficult right now. We're in a in a very kind of like um financially awkward time and people are managing their budget. So we we've tried to consider that all along and, and make the very best products, but but within reach of players. Uh, but do a job, do a job on the stage. So that was the kind of the, the fundamentals to to release and Janista. I just I think they were really shoving the Janista at whatever demographic I was involved with. Perhaps you know I don't know. You know you'd have to speak to those guys. They're much cleverer than me. But um, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I was like thinking because the, the Signia stuff's beautiful and completely different to the Janista. So. I, I wasn't, I think, and I, equally, I think I was so um, just a little bit in awe of the whole process that I wouldn't have dared to say, can I have one of each? You know, I wasn't that, I'm still not that blog, but, um, you know, but I wish I, I wish I was that blog because I'd love to have had a, a, a signature, a signia off the shelf. So it wasn't the thing then, but now that I look back, because I've got a bit more, you know, nerdy on the drum thing that I think, what on earth are you doing? We're approached by, by Matt Helders, I guess in 2011, with this idea to do a like a, a union flag kit, and I think at that time we didn't know that they had been announced to to be part of the opening ceremony of the, the 2012 Olympics. Um, but he had this very kind of like specific idea to make it look a little bit more kind of aged in its appearance, so it wasn't pure white; it was an off off white kind of almost yellow kind of appearance to it, and we uh, designed that locally. Um, we developed the wrap locally. And um, at that time, we didn't really have a kind of like a facility for kind of like producing the drums. So we're kind of, shall we say, in limbo. And, and I recall very vividly myself and George Frederick at the time, the artist relations guy, we were covering this drum in the kind of like the, the office kitchen area down in, uh, in in Kibworth and actually doing that ourselves and drilling it and assembling it all by hand. And to see that then, you know, six months later, 
was on the kind of like the opening ceremony at the <laughs> the Olympics, it was it was quite something. It was it did give us goosebumps, and it, at the same time, just recalling how we had to get this over the line. Um, right. The future for Premier is, as we say, we 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 want to kind of like absolutely be mindful of the legacy that's kind of gone before us and i think it's 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 really important that those three values of design um innovation and engineering we, we want to use this as like a blueprint to kind of like drive the company forward so we are looking right now at products in all kind of aspects of the business you know whether it be kind of hardware whether it's accessories snare drums marching orchestral we are delving into all those areas to to look at what we can do to like develop a really kind of like comprehensive range that really kind of reflects the premier ethos that we used to see when you used to receive those rebound catalogs um you know and they were just all encompassing and you'd lose yourself in those you know you'd want everything from a from a drum set to a snare to a marimba to a, a marching drum you know they're all kind of desirable percussion products and that's what we want to kind of like emulate today and make sure that those products are like you know befitting of the brand but are right for today's players